Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. Equities down hard in China, less so in Europe and in the United States. We recover just a little bit. Futures are down a third of 1% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. Lockdowns in China rattling investors. The Chinese element of the story is dominating on the day. Widening lockdowns across uh, China. China is continuing to be very strict. Potentially a big policy error. That concern is intensifying uh, across the board. We're having a, a risk off moment. Stopped running out of steam. Renminbi uh, coming down. There could be more downside. China is just one of the factors. All the cyclical dynamics we're seeing are pretty much unprecedented. That added to inflation, real positive rates. I mean, it's very hard to make long calls. Big question mark and a big uncertainty for the global economy. Joining us now, TPW's Jay Piloski, Seema Shah of Principal Global Investors. Seema, first to you. You've cut your call on Europe. You've done the same on EM. Is China a big part of that story? Actually, we're, we're a little bit more positive about China. And um, I know that sounds surprising when you hear about the news today. But we are taking some confidence that they're going to be trying to move policy in the right direction. Now, it's only a neutral call at this stage. And I think having seen the performance of Chinese stocks recently, um, I think the valuations are steadily more attractive. But this is not the time to go overweight, given the amount of uncertainty that lies ahead. A local media reporting in the last hour that Beijing is to request mass testing for a second district. The fear is that these lockdowns spread from Shanghai to Beijing. Jay Piloski, do you take that more constructive view on things happening at the moment? Uh, well, it's definitely a challenge, John, right? I mean, we seem to be hit no matter where we are in the tripolar world, whether it's Europe with uh, Ukraine and Russia, whether it's China now with uh, COVID again, or whether here it's in the States with uh, just keep adding to the rate hike expectations and extrapolating ever higher. So it's challenging to be an optimist. But as Shima said, uh, valuations are reasonably compelling. Earnings growth is better than expected. And for all the doubts about the economy, the data continues to be pretty robust, especially in Europe, for example, with the recent PMIs being uh, not at all recessionary. Jay, you're perfectly positioned to talk about this cross-asset. The FX channel here, something's developing now that did not develop last year, and that's some Chinese currency weakness for a fifth straight session. A move on dollar China of nine-tenths of one percent, one full percentage point, and that kind of stuff is pretty rare, Jay. How are you internalizing those kind of moves? Yeah, it's absolutely right, John. And it's funny you mention that because the reserve uh, uh, cut requirement uh, today after the close in China is the opposite of what they were doing a year ago when uh, they were worried about too strong uh, currency in China and they were cut and they were raising that uh, reserve rate requirement. So, I mean, I think uh, in essence, uh, the currency is not a huge issue for China at this point. They control the currency. They're highly unlikely to let it get out, get out of hand. We had a view a couple months ago of China 2022 being a glide path. Uh, that's been completely wrong uh, this first quarter. It's been anything but a glide path. Uh, so I'm a little bit hesitant to uh, make too many opinions about the, the near-term future. But in essence, um, I think China has the policy flexibility, both monetary and fiscal, to deal uh, with the situation. And they have the experience to deal with covid for example, uh, plants in uh, Shanghai are already restarting production. So, yes, they, they shut things down quickly, much more aggressively, very different than the rest of the world. And then they gradually reopen. And I think that's going to continue to be the case uh, throughout this year. Some of the biggest moves we've seen in Chinese markets going all the way back to spring 2020, February 2020, to be precise. Joining us now to discuss that, Katie Lines. Morning, Katie. Good morning, John. Well, that Forex uh, reserve ratio cut that you were just talking about did not come in time to boost sentiment in the Asian session overnight. As you said, the CSI 300, that benchmark in China having its worst day since February of 2020, it is now at its lowest since April of that year. This is clearly a market concern about COVID zero policy and whether or not stimulative measures coming from Beijing 
Beijing are going to be an, enough to support the economy in the face of that. And of course, this was not just a sell-off limited to Chinese assets or to Chinese stocks in particular. It's really rippling across assets across the world, weighing heavily on the commodity complex. You have Brent crude down more than 4%, 102, a little south of there, a barrel trading at the moment. Then you saw big moves in iron ore and a lot of the metals overnight. The Bloomberg Industrial Metals Index is off by about 3%. At the same time, you're seeing a haven bid into the likes of the U.S. Treasury market. That 10-year yield down eight basis points to 282 or so. And of course, you're seeing a stronger dollar as well. And as you were discussing, a weaker Chinese yuan along with that, John, the Chinese yuan at its weakest since November of 2020. So that maybe is why you're starting to see uh, the policy response in that Forex Reserve uh, ratio cut. Uh, that you were just talking about. Finally, I would note as well that this is reading through into the ADRs of Chinese companies that are listed here in the U.S. Alibaba, Baidu, JD.com, Neo, all down in the ballpark of two to even close to 4%, John. Kelly Light, thank you. There's enough to get gloomy about, that's for sure, right now. I'm looking over to China. Jonathan Goblin of Credit Suisse just put out this piece in the last hour or so, just reminding us, actually, what we expected on earnings at the start of the quarter and what we're getting so far. Jonathan Gollub wrote the following. At the beginning of 1Q22 and the reporting season, consensus expectations were for 4.3% EPS, with many investors and pundits expecting an outright contraction in profits. At the current pace, he says, 1Q EPS growth should end at 11.9%. Margins are contributing 80% of the upside. Those numbers, that data coming from the team at Credit Suisse. Seema, does that play into your view of the world at the moment, that perhaps we've got a little bit too gloomy too soon on earnings? Yeah, you know, Jonathan makes such a good point there. And it's, I think for investors, look, we know that there is probably weakness coming given all the various dynamics with the Fed tightening, um, Europe, the conflict. You know, there's so many things, but we have to be make sure that we're not too early to this negative feelings. So, you know, we can see that the recession chances will probably start to increase pretty drastically in late 2023. But for the time being, actually, the growth indicators are quite strong. So we would still anticipate a positive year for earnings growth, certainly not as high as we saw in 2021. These are kind of single digit numbers, but still strong enough to get some positive returns. Seema, geographically speaking, do you still have a US bias? We do. We look at this and we say, look, you know, fine, the Fed is, of course, tightening more aggressively than what you're seeing in Europe. But the reason is, is that the US is less vulnerable to a lot of the dynamics that are out there. We continue to see households very much flush with cash. We see that balance sheets are still very, very strong. All these excess earnings, sorry, excess savings does mean that companies continue to have pricing power. Um, so for that reason, we continue to like the US, although admittedly we have dialed down that risk a little bit. Why did you dial it down, just out of interest? Yeah, partly because, you know, we can see that the growth outlook is softening. But I want to be, you know, we have to be really careful here. As we said before, it's not recession for 2023. So that softening growth outlook does mean that the risks on the downside are starting to build up. So in terms of kind of picking up pennies in front of that steamroller, we want to be really careful. And I think for that time, it makes sense to be a little bit more selective, uh, pick out your sectors more carefully and bring down some of those risk levels. Jay, on that US bias, that tees you up perfectly because I know from experience you take the other side of the trade in a big way. Oh, I like pain, John. What can I tell you? Um, I, I think, look, the markets are in a state of confusion um, talking about 14 rate hikes in the cycle and then a recession in the U.S. Same in Europe, talking about two rate hikes this year and a recession next year. I mean, there's just inconsistencies kind of across the board, almost wherever you look. And, and our view has been and continues to be that we're in a high nominal growth rate environment. So inflation plus real growth, probably 6 to 8 percent in the U.S. and Europe this year versus pre-COVID, 2 to 4 percent. And markets and investors are having a hard time understanding that. And it plays right into Jonathan's point on the earnings. Earnings expectations in the U.S. and Europe this year, single digit, very, very beatable in a high nominal growth rate environment. And so those are one of the, that's one of the things that keeps us positive, along with um, the idea, the, the sense of sentiment and positioning and all these things are at very, what, 20-year lows across almost anything you want to look at. And so, yes, we have been uh, underweight the U.S., overweight non-U.S., uh, particularly with a focus on Europe and China, which has definitely been painful, uh, as well as Brazil. And look, I think the market is throwing up all sorts of opportunities, uh, particularly right now in the commodity space, given the sell-off uh, last week and early this week. Um, you're having an opportunity to step back into some of the things that got really hot. And it's an example of what I think is a rotational market correction rather than a systemic uh, market uh, crash. 
Jay Pulaski, Seema Shah are going to be sticking with us into the opening bell. Big tech, a big week coming for them, coming right up. We'll talk about that in just a moment. A big morning for Twitter. Getting very, very close to the offer price of Elon Musk. Ed Ludlow on the West Coast taking a look at this deal. Ed, the reporting this morning suggesting that perhaps it could happen today. <laughs> Yeah, good morning, John. It seems we're in the final stretch. According to sources, Twitter's board and Elon Musk's representatives were working into the early hours of this morning. A deal could come as soon as today. If things go smoothly, we're working towards the original deal. $54.20 a share values Twitter at around $43 billion. You look at where we are in pre-market, up 4.8%. We're closing the gap, trading at above $51 a share if we hold into the open on where that is. The key piece of reporting, John, according to sources, Musk is continuing to talk with potential equity partners for the bid and vet potential co-investors. You remember that he secured financing of $25.5 billion in various forms of debt from some of the biggest names on Wall Street, including Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, MUFG, but the $21 billion would come in equity financing, either out of his own pocket or from a potential partner. And that is the part of the process that's still ongoing. And John, as with any deal, sources telling us that things could be prolonged or that they could fall apart altogether. We'll have to see what happens throughout the day. What an interesting moment for this company. Ed, we're going to touch base with you around the opening bound, buddy. Looking forward to it. And we'll catch up with Dan Ives of Wedbush in just a moment, too. Coming up, a big week for big tech. I think the earnings this week are going to be important, but I think it's what they say about the future and the problems that we're seeing out of China right now that is going to be important for any of the hardware makers. That conversation up next. We're still in that knee-jerk reaction of rates are going higher, growth is slowing down, so sell technology. And I mean, you've seen some of the tech stocks hold up pretty well. I, mean, I think the earnings this week are going to be important, but I think it's what they say about the future and the problems that we're seeing out of China right now that is going to be important for any of the hardware makers. But if you just think about technology in general, I think we do have to start thinking of parts of it. A big week for big tech coming right up after Netflix results triggered a $1 trillion haircut. From the Nasdaq 100, Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs dropping by to get us up to speed. Hey, Taylor. Yeah, John, certainly a big week. So make sure to be tuning in, of course, after the closing bell. I want to start with, of course, maybe one this morning, Activision Blizzard. Typically, maybe not a big, big tech, except that Microsoft, of course, still underway to try to buy that company. So looking for any guidance, of course, ahead of that. And then, of course, we will hear from Microsoft on Tuesday. And then, of course, we'll be heading into Alphabet BI out with a really interesting note this morning, seeing YouTube ads are seeing two times faster growth, of course, than Netflix. So further commentary, of course, on the ad market space. And then we'll round it out with that consumer focus. We'll have Meta, Amazon, Apple, and yes, Twitter, of course, on Friday. You changed up the board, and John, sort of the print coming into this doesn't look good. The NASDAQ 100 having the worst month, almost off now, 10% since the Lehman failure. So you really have to go back many, many years to see this type of big, big declines here so far for the month. Uh, real big refocus here on rates and, of course, what it means for those valuations. Not just a big tech index, though, John, but some of the big uh, individual names within that sector also down. Um, only 18 members in April are up in the NASDAQ 100. 40% of that index is down by double digits. Netflix, as you can see here, you're off about 43%. The worst performer in the S&P now for the year, you're off 64% year to date. Taylor, let's bring that calendar up of earnings this week. Mm. Of all the companies that report through the week, what have you and the team at a close got your eye on? Well, trying to balance it all at 4 o'clock, of course, first. But I think as you think about not only sort of the M&A environment, Microsoft arguably maybe the only one that can actually get it done, given they've gone through sort of their uh, M&A regulatory scrutiny uh, a few decades ago and then really pushing forward to Meta. Remember, sort of with Netflix, John, um, they had guided us down earlier, similar with Meta. Remember, last quarter they've also guided us down. So that will be sort of a, a further reaction here. And then it has to be that consumer focus as we think about the health of the consumer in this environment, Apple and Amazon, and dare I say it, Twitter, can we do that? I think we've got to, <laughs> haven't we, at the moment, Taylor? Thank you. Looking forward to the show through the week after the bow. Taylor and the team reporting the earnings. I'm looking forward to Apple just to kind of get a read on China, given what's happening at the moment. For the Nasdaq 100 this month, down 10%. 
and heading for its worst monthly decline going all the way back to 2008. Stuart Kaiser UBS ran in the following this morning. A further step higher in hawkish FOMC pricing put markets and tech in particular under a new pressure. Ultimately, we see improved risk reward for the Nasdaq 100 as easing inflation in coming months will allow the Fed to soften rhetoric. Jay Pulaski, Seema Shah still with us. Seema, can you speak to that, please? This relationship between the Fed and the damage that's been done to the Nasdaq 100. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the Fed's hawkishness is really driving bond yields high, as we've all seen, and, and this is really challenging those big tech companies. I think Stuart's point there, it's interesting. Look, I think we can see inflation probably peaking within the next couple of months. And I think there's going to be downward pressure on bond yields from here on at some, you know, within the next couple of weeks. Um, because if you have any kind of forecast for recession within the next few years, that is going to push down on bond yields. So hopefully the most challenging time for big tech is almost behind us. Um, and then when we look beyond that outlook into kind of 2023, if you think about the more challenging economic environment, that's a time when you still want these very big balance sheet companies with the cash flow and the pricing power. But I do think that the next couple of quarters um, could be particularly different, difficult for these ones because of, you know they, they were ultimately they were COVID beneficiaries. So that dynamic is starting to fade. Jay, what would get you excited about these big US tech names? Well, I uh, wrote a piece uh, two weeks ago, John, called Fever Break, where I argued that infl the inflation peak is already uh, upon us and the next several months are baked in for lower numbers and posited uh, what would happen to stocks if by July, let's say, inflation is down from eight to five, heading lower, growth is okay, where do stocks trade? And I think where we're taking our kind of tech uh, bet and tech exposure is not in the FANG names. Those are the old style growth. We're focused on innovation and uh, new growth opportunities. Tesla is a perfect example, John, right? Reported last week, blowout numbers, stock was up 10%. And then we had Jay Powell uh, speak about 50 basis points in May. And that uh, gain evaporated, probably going to trade below uh, that uh, open post earnings uh, today. And so I think the market, again, is kind of really confused, taking stuff right up front and discounting that immediately without really thinking about uh, the longer term. So to us, valuation is compelling. All these uh, cyber names, uh, fintech names, uh, climate names, the thematics have all round tripped. Uh, valuation is compelling. They're cheaper than the private markets. There's M&A opportunity, as we're seeing with Twitter, as we're seeing uh, with, uh, with cyberspace in uh, recent uh, weeks. So to me, that's where the opportunity lies. But I think we are at the peak of inflation. Rates on the 10-year, 3% is a very tough level to get through. We're probably going back to 2.5, 2.4, and then gradually work higher if we're right on our view of higher nominal growth, not just in 22, but also in 23 and 24. Jay, you made a couple of points there. Let's pick up on two of them. I want to go, first of all, with Twitter and Tesla. On Tesla, something that wasn't asked on the call in the last week was the issue with Twitter. How much key man risk is there at that company? And how distracted do you think the CEO will be, given what's developing this morning with Twitter? Yeah, that's a great question, John. And I actually think not very much, right? I mean, just think about what Tesla's been able to accomplish. In the last month, they've opened two state-of-the-art production platforms in two separate continents. That's why we call it one of the world's first tripolar world companies. They have production in Shanghai, in Asia, production in Berlin, in Europe, production in California, and now Austin in the United States. It's unparalleled. They've been able to maneuver through all these shortages and semiconductor issues, et cetera, et cetera. They bought up their battery supply. They're, they're so far ahead of the rest of the competition in the EV space. And they will be able to sell every EV vehicle they produce over the next couple of years without any problem. They are, they're going to max out on production for the next several years. And yet the market has no idea of how to value them. And so it trades up and down uh, crazy. I don't actually think there's very much key man risk in Tesla. Jay, what do you say to the doubters who look at Netflix and a performance say in the last week and say, well, they didn't used to have competition and now they do in a big way and look at this. And they look at the likes of Tesla and say, well, look at what every single automobile company manufacturer on the planet is doing right now. Surely they make a dent in what everything that Tesla's achieved. Why do you push back against that, Jay? Well, because I think the demand for EV is just going to be off the charts across the world, right? If uh, transportation 
and power generation, John, are the two areas where we need to get uh, carbon down dramatically. EV addresses the transportation. And if you look at projections, you even just look at the sales this year. Uh, it used to be one uh, million EV vehicles a year. Now that's being done in a matter of months. So the production and the demand is going to expand considerably around the world, which is why Tesla is uniquely positioned. They have production platforms in each region. Nobody else does. Just look at their ability to produce this quarter versus uh, the traditional auto names, which are not have not been able to make the move and then establish their supply chains for lithium, for copper, for nickel, the things that go into the batteries, and so for semiconductors. And so to me, uh, it's a different ballgame. And I, I'll just quote the uh, Morgan Stanley analyst who said, you know, when we look at Twitter's recent results, our concerns are for the ability of the rest of the industry to catch up. In other words, Tesla is expanding its lead, not uh, its lead is not contracting. Seymour, I want to give you the final word. Jay made a few points. One was on Tesla, another was on getting inflation back down. We might have seen a mechanical peak in CPI. But to Jay's point, if we get back down to a world of, say, 5%, inflation. Seema, how do you expect this market to trade around that? Look, if you've got inflation about 5% at the end of the year, the Fed is still going to be very, very uncomfortable. Um, so at that point, they still need to be, move above neutral. They still need to be moving pretty aggressively. And the only um, scenario where they don't do that is if they're willing to sit with inflation above 3%, which I have to say, it's a theory which is becoming more and more popular. And I think we're starting to buy into it a little bit more. That's the one that gets my attention too. Seema Shah, Jay Pulaski. Mm -hmm. To you both, thank you very much. And, Jay, thank you, sir, for your views on Tesla and Twitter as well. We're going to be talking about that in just a moment. The morning calls next and later. Twitter is said to be on track to reach a deal with Elon Musk potentially as soon as today. Dan Ives of Wedbush joins us very shortly around the opening bout to discuss that stock of 51.15. The offer, as you know, 54.20. In the pre-market, seven minutes away from the opening bout in New York City. Things recovering on the S&P 500. Futures negative, just four-tenths of one percent after the carnage in China spills over to Europe. And earlier this morning, spilled over stateside as well. We erase those losses from New York. This is Bloomberg. Three days of losses on the S&P could become four. Futures down about a half of 1%. On the Nasdaq, we are lower for three straight weeks coming into this week. That is the longest weekly losing streak going all the way back to last year. It has been that long, the longest losing weekly streak of the year so far. The Nasdaq on the month down 10%. It has been ugly for that particular index. That's the price action here at the morning calls this morning. First up, Goldman downgrading Verizon to neutral. $55 price target, seeing limited upside potential over the next 12 months. Deutsche Bank downgrading Kellogg to hold, expecting inflation and supply disruptions to remain a risk. And finally, Raymond James upgrading AMD to a strong buy, pointing to the chipmaker's attractive valuation ahead of next week's earnings report. Their stock is up by about 1% at $89 and one cent. Coming up, Elon Musk said to be closing in on a deal for Twitter. The clock striking midnight for the board of directors. That's the view from Wedbush's Dan Ives. He joins us around the opening bell in just a moment. Four minutes away from the opening bell with futures negative four tenths of one percent. Twenty-four seconds away from the up and about in New York City this Monday morning. Good morning to you all. We are looking at a four-day losing streak on the S&P after a three-day losing streak coming into Monday. On the Nasdaq, we're lower too by around about a half of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. A brutal month for that particular index, and we take some more weight off it. Let's see opening bow, switch out the board and get to the bond market. Your 10-year yield looks a little something like this. Yields lower by nine basis points, the 280.63. The concerns about lockdowns in China spreading from Shanghai to Beijing spreading right the way through this market with crude down by more than five percentage points to a 96 handle on WTI at 96.35. The dollar rip roar in strength, euro dollar 107.26, euro dollar negative six tenths of one percent. That's the only morning price action at the opening bow with some movers. Let's get to Katie Lyons. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, a lot of movers this morning are tied to the story in China. Fears about a lockdown potentially in Beijing, what that is going to mean for economic growth, supply chain issues, and of course, demand for commodities. As a result, you're seeing some supply side sensitive stocks like the semiconductors under pressure. NVIDIA is 
one of them down about 1.7 percent. Then on the commodities demand side, you're seeing oil lower, the metals lower, and that is translating through to commodity tied stocks like Freeport McMoran, which of course operates in the metal space. It's down 4.6 percent. There are some earnings stories out there as well, including Philips, which of course is the Dutch medical devices maker. It reported earnings in the European hours uh, this morning, basically warning of persistent supply chain challenges and said inflationary pressure may stick around for years. A big miss for that company is down 11 and a half percent as a result. But on the more optimistic side, yes, dealing with inflationary pressures, but passing those costs on to their consumers through price hikes. Coca-Cola beating on the top and bottom line revenue up organic revenue up 18 percent in the quarter. That stock up about 2.6 percent at the open. John Kelly, thank you. About a minute and 25 seconds into this session. Here's one to watch Twitter up by about 4 percent in early trading. We are trading in the 50s and getting closer to that offer price of Elon Musk of 54.20. Something has changed over the last week. Let's get to Ed Ludlow on the West Coast for more. Ed, what changed? Yeah, it's interesting. What changed, according to sources, is that Twitter's board started to take this offer more seriously when Elon Musk disclosed that he had the financial commitments from Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Barclays, MUFG, a whole list of other banks who were providing $25.5 in debt financing. But you look at Tesla, we're down 2.4% Tesla. Sources tell us that the missing piece here is that Elon Musk continues to line up equity partners. So there's $25.5 billion of debt committed. And then Elon Musk himself is committing $21 billion of equity financing. But if he does not find equity partners, one option is for him to sell some of his Tesla shares to fund a part of that equation, which I thought was interesting. According to sources, this is the final stretch, John. We could have a deal announced as soon as today. The board worked into the early hours of this morning with Musk's advisors. There's reporting from what happened over the weekend. In fact, it's kind of a replica of what we saw from the Easter Passover weekend when Elon Musk had his advisors and bankers working that Saturday night into Sunday morning so that we had something for the following Monday, very much playing out in a similar way here. But as with all deals, John, and we say it time and again, sources are warning us it could go on, could stretch out and could be called off altogether. Ed, what are you hearing about how complicated the financing and the backing is for this particular bid? Complicated in the sense that Musk was speaking for different types of equity partners, a wide range according to sources, family offices, high net worth individuals. Then there's the role of private equity, right? We know that Toma Bravo was coming in. We know that Apollo was coming in. And interesting, in the case of Apollo, sources told us that they could back a Musk bid, but they could also go to Twitter and help them ward off this kind of takeover attempt. I think you're, you know, listening to Dan Ives, for example, Webbush, some of the other street analysts, what did not happen was a white knight did not come in, right? And so now Elon Musk has options, but the board does seem amenable because of that debt finance, financing that Musk was able to secure. At another company you report on Tesla, it is trading right. lower by about two and a half percent. No drama here, not a massive move, but have we got a clear read on what it could mean for that company? Yeah, there's lots of split opinion on this, right? Why is Musk doing this in the first place with Twitter? Is he distracted from leadership at Tesla? I thought it was very telling on the Tesla earnings call that Musk did not speak first. Zach Kirkhorn, the CFO, did. Drew Baglino, who's the SVP for energy and drivetrain products, took a lot of ownership on the call. So there's a company there where other lieutenants are getting involved. Musk spends a lot of time on Twitter. He has done for years. He's spending a lot of time, my sources tell me, at SpaceX. This is status quo for him, right? And this is just his latest endeavour. Hey, Ed. Thank you, buddy. Ed Ludlow on the West Coast. He mentioned Dan Ives. This is the view from Wedbush and Dan Ives. The Twitter board could not find a white knight. The clock has essentially struck midnight for the board, which is why negotiations are underway to get a deal done. Dan Ives joins us right now. Dan, do you believe this deal closes today and why? I think a deal gets done in the next 24 hours. But because ultimately, as Ed talked about, the financing, once they wait it out, that really put feet to the fire for, from a board's perspective. And they ultimately needed a white knight, a second bidder to come in. You know, probably books went around. Private equity basically just couldn't get there. So that's why, from a board's perspective, they had to come to negotiation with Musk, a Game of Thrones, and ultimately it looks like the next 24 hours, Musk will on Twitter. Hey Dan, have you got a decent idea of what the plan is? Look, I think, you know, as this goes private, the first thing was turn to a subscription model monetize it, they'll lose a significant amount of subs of probably a two, three dollars a month type subscription model. That would increase revenues, cash flow. So I think from a model perspective, that's something that happens right off the board. You, of course, getting rid of the bots, cleaning up the platform, 
potentially combining with some other initiatives, some other acquisitions. I think that's ultimately the goal here because it comes down to freedom of speech is one thing. He's betting 20 percent of his net worth on Twitter. So I think that ultimately, you know, now the strategy really needs to be outlaid. What are the benefits of being private, Dan? Everything you said that they're going to do, what do they need to go private to do that they can't do as a public company? That's a great question. They could do it behind the scenes. Uh, every quarter, they don't have to answer shareholders. You know, I think that's really the difficult part when, when you go through a transition like this to, from a quarterly perspective. And, and, and I think that's why they would take it private. Ultimately, maybe over the next few years, come back out and, you know, it could always go public down the road. But look, I think it just came down to the board was looking for a second bidder. They thought a second bidder would come. It never came fiduciary they had to sit down and now must it looks like it's in a course uh, you know i'd say the last stage to get this deal done dan you mentioned that they'll push and lean heavily on a subscription model how do you think advertisers will react to this i think there'll be clear pushback and i think ultimately right now this becomes a lightning rod on both sides of the aisle you know in terms of how this ultimately is going to sort of as a platform. And for Musk, there, there's political risk in terms of for Tesla, for SpaceX. I think that's why you're seeing that react accordingly in terms of shares. Ultimately, the equity finance that Ed talked about, I think that's something that you know, he just got $25 billion of stock from a, from a target that they, they reached. So I think that's a big issue. But no doubt, I mean, what you're essentially doing here in the eyes of many, you're trading caviar for a New York City hot dog in terms of Tesla for Twitter shares. And it's a head scratcher. But ultimately, it looks like probably by the end of the day, this deal gets done. Dan, you just said something really interesting. You think this invites risk, regulatory risk, for the likes of Tesla and other Elon Musk ventures because of what he might do with Twitter. Can you just build that out a little bit more? Look, at the end of the day, from a Tesla shareholder perspective, this is not what you want to see. There, there's no benefit for Tesla or SpaceX, but it invites both in the Beltway as well as Brussels more of that polarized view, right? Some view Musk because you hear other view him as a villain. It just increases that sort of, you know, I think noise at a time that Tesla investors don't want to see it. So let's just be clear. That's why Tesla sells off here. As a Tesla investor, buying Twitter, that's not what you want to see. But it is what it is. Musk is going to get it. There is no second bidder. And now it's really just a matter of, I think, timing and, you know, sort of dotting the I's, crossing the T's to get this done. Dan, just on key man risk, Jay Pulaski of TW joined us in the last hour and he said he doesn't see it at Tesla. I know a lot of people who do. Where do you stand on that, Dan? I think much sole focus, at least over the next year or two. I mean, Tesla is a major focus. We've seen it with the Giga build outs, of course, with Cybertruck and you know some of the, the issues they have to navigate in China. But balancing a lot of balls here, right? I mean, if you look at the situation with SpaceX now and Twitter, he wouldn't be CEO of Twitter, probably a chairman role. But no doubt, there's going to be a bright spotlight here. That's also why Musk, you know, likely another comp package to make sure he stays on as CEO and chairman, no issues for the next five years. But look, it just adds more uncertainty. And, and just look, go back the last two weeks. I mean, the street viewed it, it was a 10%, maybe 5% chance this deal gets done. Now it's probably upper 90s. And Dan, got to wrap things up with earnings season. What a big week for big tech. We've had a three-week losing streak on the NASDAQ 100. We're down for a fourth straight session on the month. We're down by, let's call it 10% now. Down the worst month going back to 2008. Microsoft this week. We've got the likes of Amazon over the next week. Apple, Facebook, Alphabet. Take your pick, Dan. How important is this week? I think it's the most important week for tech earnings probably in the last seven, eight years. Because of the white knuckles, because of the Netflix debacle, you need to see strength on enterprise, you need to see strength on cloud, and of course, from a productized perspective with a name like Apple. So this is, it's a fork in the road week. I believe ultimately bullish and it leads tech higher, but no doubt, I mean, this is, John, I think it's the most important week that we've seen in tech in many, many years for in terms of earnings season. Tell me the names you expect to see strength on relative to the weakness that the market is priced for and the names that you think we will see that weakness realized. Yeah, so bullishness, I think significantly better in the street would be Microsoft uh, on the cloud story. I think Apple is another one. I think Google in terms of cloud strength that we're seeing on GCP, in, in terms of negatives, it's meta, Facebook. Because fundamentally, I think that's the business model has changed there. 
that's catching a falling knife. So I think it's a bifurcation. And I also think cybersecurity is the pocket that's going to continue to be strong along with cloud. Dan, just awesome to catch up. Big week ahead. Hopefully we catch up again soon. Dan Ives there of Wedbush with the Nasdaq down about a half of 1%. The S&P down three quarters of 1%. Coming up, Senator Warren urging Democrats to get inflation under control. I think we're going to be in real trouble if we don't get up and deliver. Then I believe that Democrats are going to lose. That conversation, up next. in real trouble if we don't get up and deliver then i believe that democrats are going to lose democrats win when they do what when they work on behalf of working people senator warren delivering a warning to democrats to get inflation under control secretary yellen saying prices are nearing a top we want to do everything that we can to lower inflation and uh, the president has announced a, an unprecedented release of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that is serving to um, hold down uh, oil prices. I think gas prices peaked and have now come down some uh, from their peak. Team coverage starts right now with Anne-Marie Hordern joining us in D.C. Michael McKee here in New York. Anne-Marie, the message from Senator Warren pretty clear. Yeah, it is pretty clear that they have very little time to try to turn this narrative around. And Jonathan, if you've been paying attention, as I know you have, poll after poll, this is top of the minds of American voters. It is inflation. That what comes back every single month for a matter of months. And right now, it's critically important because during election seasons, it's the spring and the summer leading into that November vote where really you start to see voters' minds harden about the policies they care about and the individuals they want to support. And Elizabeth Warren saying they need to do something on inflation. Now, if you listen a little bit more to what she had to say, she gave three things that she thinks the Democrats need to focus on. One is about uh, price gouging and uh, having the FTC go after companies for price gouging. Two, uh, putting a stop on student debt, those loans. And then three, making sure that members of Congress, Jonathan, don't have the ability to trade stocks. She thinks that this is something they could deliver to the American people before November. They'd be in a better place. I'm not sure how much that will help get inflation down, but I, I take well, your point. That's something they could do with the electorate. <laughs> Number four, Mike McKee, raise interest rates. That job is the Federal Reserve's. That job's the Federal Reserve's, and they're not Democrats or Republicans over there. To underscore what Emory was talking about, though, you go back to 1992, not directly comparable because it was a presidential, not a midterm election year, but we were coming out of a war over oil. Oil prices were elevated. And consumer sentiment, as measured by the University of Michigan, the current uh, sentiment is the uh, uh, number was going down into the election and that it tells you about all you need to know what uh, Emory was talking about it's the economy stupid it's what people think before the election about how things are going and then look at the white line below that that's consumer current confidence right now that's bad news for the Democrats shaping up now we'll get a lot of information on inflation this week uh, some of it may be a little bit better on Monday we get new home sales and home prices plus a consumer confidence number uh, we're gonna watch not just to see if home sales are slowing but if home prices are slowing, that would be important for inflation. If you want to argue stagflation, take a look at Wednesday. You get GDP numbers then, and on Friday we get the Fed's PCE inflation number, which is, of course, the one that they target, the 2%. Is the news going to be a bit better? Well, the forecast is yes. We talked about having a... Uh, a, a peak in inflation last month, and that may be the case. The forecast is we see inflation start to fall over the next months to almost 2% by the end of 2023. But is that soon enough for politics? Some good news, maybe. Mike McKee, thank you. And as I've mentioned a few times already this morning, no Fed speak this week. Also good news for many of us. I know. Mike McKee, Anne-Marie, thank you to you both. Joining us now, the wonderful, the brilliant Oksana Aronoff of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, who for a long time has warned about what's happening in credit, and she's been positioned for it. 
Oksana, you still say, though, credit risk is not repriced. You have not seen enough damage. Walk us through it. Good morning, John. No, we certainly have not seen enough damage in, in credit risk. In fact, you know, history is um, uh, somewhat informative here. And if we look back, even as recent as the hike uh, that the Fed, the hiking cycle the Fed went through in 2015 to 2018, a significantly more benign inflationary environment, right? Inflation got up to, oh my God, like 2% um, and a higher unemployment rate than what we have today. And we saw not just credit risk go through a more dramatic repricing with high yield spreads pushing up against 500 back then, but also in terms of where the 10 year was, the terminal rate of the 10 year by the time that hiking cycle was over, cycle was over, was you know about 30 basis points higher uh, than where we are today. So I think not even in terms of the interest rate risk pain, which has been all of the pain the bonds have uh, tolerated so far, even that is likely not done. We do not know what quantitative easing has in store for us. We don't know how that ultimately will work out. We don't know what the path of these hikes will be. Um, and that all will have an impact on where the 10 year will ultimately end up. So this is, you know, this continues to be a time for caution. Certainly some things have worked. They've worked for us as well, certain shorts on, you know, various parts of the curve, as well as on things like emerging market debt, which did, re you know, has repriced more significantly in light of the interest rate risk. But this is definitely not the time to be moving wholesale into credit risk. Oksana, okay. another thing that worked because a lot of people piled into it, leveraged loans. There was that comfort, and I think you're discussing this. There was a comfort between taking, say, credit risk over duration risk. So people took their exposure, their credit exposure through leveraged loans over, say, high yield. Morgan Stanley, the latest actually to close out that position. Are you expecting this pain to spread just a little bit more in a way that it hasn't done? year to date. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So uh, leveraged loans is the sole sector in fixed income that has been able to generate a somewhat positive return year to date uh, because of its floating rate nature. But of course, these are junk rated issuers. And as the cost of capital continues to uh, come up and as they continue to need to refinance themselves in this new higher cost of capital world, that will make its way in onto you know, the fundamentals of these companies. And the default prospects should return, you know, for high yield in general should return to something like the historic average of slightly above 3% and not zero, which is what spreads are pricing in right now. So loans have been sort of this least dirty shirt because of their floating rate nature, but uh, they are not going to be spared the credit risk repricing that the rest of the market will have to deal with. A part of your playbook is to carry a higher cash load in a portfolio, Oksana. What would you be looking for through the year to deploy some of that cash? So we don't, if, you know, we have liquidity, not because we love sitting on liquidity, but in this environment, which, you know, we came into the year with a lot of liquidity because we felt this was going to be a very volatile year, but also because we know that that's the part of our portfolio that will reset the fastest, right? So we are essentially right now positioned with you know, virtually no interest rate risk. We're clipping a coupon where we can to offer, um, you know, the best yield that we can in a safe uh, manner in this environment, but then it's all about that optionality longer down the road, right? It's all about the ability to take advantage of that um, opportunity when it does arise. Because remember, and we talk about this every time, John, the liquidity providers are uh, moving away from this market, right? The sell side has continued to do that for uh, quite a number of years because of the sort of de-risking that they've gone through. But also the biggest liquidity provider, the Fed, is now removing its accommodation. And that really is a game changer. So uh, yes, we continue to have a lot of dry powder in the portfolio, north of 60%. Uh, but that's what's allowed us to generate a positive return over the last year, that and a number of you know conservative plays in this market and high quality floating rate plays. And so we're now ready for the next chapter to this uh, saga so to speak. We're ready to you know, take advantage of that opportunity when it opens up, which we believe it will through the end of the year. Well, I'm looking forward to catching up with you when that time comes. And before that, too, Oksana, thank you. As always, Oksana Aronoff there of JP Morgan Asset Management. That's the credit story. Here's the equity one. We're down eight tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down about a half of one percent. This week is a huge week for big tech. Up next, your trading diary and the guide through the week into the weekend. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session, some real risk aversion out there. Four-day losing streak on the S&P 500, down around about one full percentage point. A bidding to the bond market, Treasury yields lower by 12 basis points on a 10-year, a break of 280. On the Nasdaq 100, down a half of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, aggressively lower through the month so far, down about 10 percentage points. This is the stock to watch. Can we close a deal today between the board at Twitter and Elon Musk? We trade at 50.78, the offer price 54.20. It's about $4 of doubt still in that market right there. We'll talk about that through the day. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. China's health authority holding a COVID briefing. That comes up at the top of the hour. Huge week of earnings with Microsoft and Alphabet Tuesday, Facebook on Wednesday. Then it's Apple, Amazon and Twitter on Thursday. A Bank of Japan rate decision and another round of initial jobless claims. And Q1 GDP to close out the week. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.